Hello and welcome to Eat Your Backyard. This is my YouTube channel where I show you around my food forest. I also try to give you tips on growing your own in your yard. I usually start off by this Robolini palm, which is now in full bloom. This fruit is actually edible at this stage, but uh, I'll tell you it's not that great. If you stay a little bit later in the video, we're going to eat some. Well, I'm going to eat some, and I'll tell you how it is. A Rica palm fruit, which tastes a lot like, to me, the cross between aloe vera, or let's say okra. That's a better one. Okra and banana flavor, which I like and always look forward to. We have some beautiful orange fruit on that one. Oops. I'm using the... Uh, wireless go-to system for clear audio and also using a DG, DJI handheld gimbal to keep the picture straight. And if you would like to support this channel, just go ahead and click on any of the Amazon links in the description. Go ahead and buy some shampoo or whatever you get on Amazon and that helps the channel. So I can get stuff like gimbals and so on. The videos used to be very shaky on Eat Your Backyard and I finally realized I must end the shakiness and improve the audio quality so hopefully it looks good. Also I'll tell you what you cannot beat the Apple phone for camera quality. I've played around with different cameras, video cameras and picture taking cameras over the years and I have a hard time beating this for quality, even on the live streams. It's just so much better than the previous one I had. All right. So let's look around and see what's going on. You can see we've got still the chicken chairs are still out in the yard from yesterday. My young son, Jack, had a good friend over. And they like to set up the chicken chairs, get a bunch of chickens, and just do the lap chicken thing. Feed the chickens treats, etc. Speaking of feeding the chickens treats, that's always a good way to start the morning. Sort of a ritual that I've got going, which is to feed the chickens treats. And you'll see this area over here by the, the side is kind of a stockpiling stuff currently. I'm trying not to do this, but I had a bunch of oak tree logs. That's beautiful live oak logs that I did not want to get rid of. And I put them here and I recently redid a, a project to ventilate the bunny run a little bit better. We'll go take a look at Penelope the bunny rabbit here shortly and I'll tell you what I've got growing on here too. But I just want to show, I always like to do this, show how permaculture can transform the way you look at things. Now this area, normally I would have looked at this as an annoying situation of uh, weeds growing in. But now I really do see it as a vegetable garden that's planted for free and it's vegetables for the chickens. And I've got a weed mat under here. You can help me out, but all of these, all of these plants are delicious to the chickens. This is prime chicken treat 101. So now when I see these, it's like a vegetable garden has been put here For me. A little bit more. Oh good, this log right here I can sit on. I'm also trying to hold a cup of coffee. Right. Oh look, a frisbee plate. Oh yeah, they love that crabgrass. We're gonna go feed these hens here in just a second to show you how much. They love it. I almost want to keep some of it planted so I can harvest it again, but we'll wipe it out. It'll all just grow back. It will all grow back very easily, maybe in a new spot. I have now a situation in my yard where I don't really throw much away in terms of yard waste whatsoever. I don't, there's not much leaving the property now. 
it almost is all returned back in. And just about anything I throw in the chicken pen just gets digested by the whole chicken brigade back there that will turn everything back into soil, basically, and chicken manure. They love all these. It's As I'm picking these, I'm thinking, oh, they're going to love that one. They're going to love that one. All right. That'll work. All right, let's see what these little hens think of this. Oh, they're eager. They are very eager. Everybody is here. Oh no, chicken break, chicken escape. Crazy chickens, uh-oh. Blondie the chicken wants in on it. Back in you go. My chicken latching system is failing me in real time. Oh, they're going crazy. They got a taste of it. All right, let's do it. And one thing is, when you hold the hand feed the chickens like this, they can get leverage on it with their beaks. You just have to hold it tight enough that they don't rip it out of your hands. To me, it's just fascinating that... Now, you know how this, this crop of vegetables for your chickens was produced. No harmful chemicals used, totally organic. And they'll turn those into eggs. Ooh, got the peck. Yeah, eat your backyard where you can watch hens happily eat their morning treats. I'm going to throw it over there. So they... There you go. Okay. Let's look around a little bit. Some updates. I hit this whole area with heroic levels of bunny manure. Absolute gigantic quantities. I mean, I think I had about a 10 gallon bucket, 10 gallons of bunny manure, and I emptied most of it all through here, and the result is everything is going off. This Jamaican cherry is just loaded with fruit. Most of it is, is just now, if you can see it, forming up, but the quantity of fruit, the amount of fruit per node, everything just ramps up and everywhere you look there are cherries so pretty happy about that also the fig my generi fig continues to do well it's a young tree just needed to get established and it looks like it is surprised that it's producing this much of a leaf this late in the season <clears throat> my other fig tree that's doing well uh, the brown turkey already is dropping all of its leaves and has the rust on the leaves, which is pretty typical. If you have a fig tree, it gets that black dot kind of, they call it rust, but it's like a type of fungus, I think, that gets on the leaves. This one doesn't seem to be suffering from that, which is very interesting to me. I'll keep you updated on how this does with the so-called rust, but so far so good. And this is supposed to produce giant sized figs, so we'll see. The Dwarf Malay coconut tree just continues to go off. Again, this one is turboed with the, the bunny manure. But this is, you know, even though dwarf tree, the crown of this tree will get as large as a normal coconut tree. Now, you say coconut tree, and I say that's a formidable force to deal with. you got to think that through. That's why I get the dwarf kind only, because having an 80-foot tall coconut tree is not an option for my small space. But it looks great tucked in here. You just have to keep up on the 
on the uh, trimming of it. Okay, Tracy, welcome to the stream. Thanks for the comment, I greatly appreciate it. Tracy Whippy says, I just joined, what type of fig is that one? Oh, that's a Generi, G-E-N-E-R-I, Generi. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that is what it said on the tag. I got this at a local nursery, and um, you know, I, I, it's always a risk for me putting any tree back here because of the salt situation I've got. You know, if the tree is sensitive to salt and isn't vigorous enough, it will probably not do well, like this Valencia orange tree. It's like the Charlie, ba Charlie Brown orange tree, and it's right at the point where I need to, it's dropped all of its leaves, it's stopped shooting, it's about to die. I need to dig it up and put it in the, the citrus tree or the fruit tree rescue hospital on the side of my house where they don't get sprayed and try to nurse it back to health. I wondered if it could grow through, but it didn't. Of course, it's getting shaded now by this tree, but it gets plenty of sun here. So and the fact that this did well, I am very pleased. And the custard apple tree back here is also surviving and growing and not showing. I'm looking always for the telltale signs of leaf trauma. You know, what I'm talking about there is not the bugs so much as eating it like these little weevils we've got on everything. Look, at they make Swiss cheese out of the leaves. Can't do anything about that, really. I mean, you can spray neem oil on it to dissuade it, but you're not gonna eliminate it. I don't mind it, as long as it doesn't devastate the tree, but it's this kind of stuff that I'm looking for. The brown tips, that's what alarms me. That's always seeming like a precursor to some disastrous scenario. And uh, that also tells me typically that it's got some effect to the irrigation that's getting on it, meaning that the salt or the, the sulfur or whatever's in there is bumming it out. But this new growth is also getting that same spray scenario. And uh, now look at this, this little branch, like any branch I get, I just go, oh, carbon back into the garden. The ground will digest it. it sounds kind of hippy dippy, but uh, it's true that all you really need to do is lay stuff on the ground and everything else happens automatically. Once you get the system kick-started, you know, what's going to turn that wood back into soil? Well, the hens scratching around and breaking it up, but then also physically, but then also things like fungus. And, you know, you can see I've laid wood, large oak branches around as edging in my yard. Uh, that also promotes a lot of fungus growing around which results in breaking all this stuff down very rapidly. I mean, in this climate, ooh, just walk directly face first into a spider web. It's always a, I don't know where the spider is exactly on me, but I know what kind it is. It's a little crab spider, which I don't even think they can bite you, but it's probably like the most poisonous spider in the world. All right. Yeah, but I wanted to show you the existence of fungus everywhere. It's not hard to find it. See that one? Growing. See like two or three different types growing just in this area and uh, very rapidly it takes over the wood and turns it right back into it. Look at, look at how quick. That's not, that's about six months old placement of that log and it's already being broken down, rotting rotting away. Uh, I'm going to show you something to illustrate the fact my friend told me about, suggested this, and I'm going to do it, which is to show you how salty it is. Like you might get, I don't know, if you don't live five blocks from the beach, four blocks from the beach, you, know, you might not be familiar with this scenario, but just to give an example of how much it is affected by salt, this chair is about a year old. Look. <laughs> is that nuts? Yeah, we gotta throw this chair away, obviously. Look at this. It's just disintegrated. Anywhere it wasn't sealed in, the paint. So that's how salty it is. So the fact that these trees are here means they're fairly resilient. Salt. All right, let's keep looking. 
Banana Grove. It's doing okay. These are Cavendish bananas right here, and then I've got the Musa. Need to hit it with the bunny fertilizer again. What do we have here? Giant hand of bananas. Looking pretty good. Not ripe yet. Will be ripe soon. The problem with growing bananas in Florida is the lack of water can be a concern. If you want the fruit to happen faster, you have to water it. But look at that banana flower of the Musa. Just incredible. Very good. And at the base, I already have some strong pups growing. Not this one. That one doesn't look that good. This one looks really good right next to it. So we're setting up to get a nice rhythm on this little clump here of banana, 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 which I like. I also planted some bananas under this strawberry tree. Not really sure what I expected there, but we'll see how that goes. I might transplant those now that they're getting established. The Moringa continues to grow towards the sky here. It's now at a good 10 feet tall. That one was grown from seed last year. Yeah, so starting this whole side here to get really lush. This was just a barren side area of my yard not that long ago and uh, decided to utilize edge spaces uh, in order to live up to the permaculture principle of utilizing edge spaces. And I decided I'd do it with almost everything being from cuttings. So everything you see here is from a cutting that I took from somewhere, including these pineapples, which are doing quite well now. When they start to get really long like that, I feel like pineapple time is getting close. But look how many apples you can grow in a tiny space with this kind of setup, vertical planter. By the way, I've got links in the description for this. If you want to check it out on Amazon, go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you're not already. Also, hit the thumbs up if you like these kinds of videos. Helps me in the Google algorithms. And leave a comment. I'd like to know what you think. If you're watching this video after the live stream, great time to leave a comment. That's when most of the views happen on these videos, of course. And I hope that you are inspired to get into growing more more often in whatever you're doing as a result of these. This is a key lime tree that I planted. Best way to plant a key lime tree is to get them very young. Don't get the large one and plant it in a place where it can, it's not necessarily going to have full, full sun. I think that's the way to go. This June plum tree that I planted here has been doing very well. Now this thing would be very susceptible to salt, but I've got it in the corner of the yard where it's isolated and and sheltered and it's doing fantastic. Look at the June plums. This is a relative of the mango. Look at these June plums. Beautiful. They'll get about like golf ball size. There's plenty in there. I like the fact this is a new one. I tried to grow it years ago and they died. So this is a lessons learned type of situation. Put it in the right spot. But the June plum is just so delicious. Now salad trees. That was in the title of the video. This is a salad tree. This is a type of tree which you can eat the leaves. It's delicious and as you can see it's missing some leaves right there because I ate a few yesterday and uh, they were delicious. This is the kind of thing you could sprinkle in with a salad and it gives a cranberry flavor basically to it. I think like a zesty almost a citrusy cranberry flavor. It's a very pleasant, very tasty leaf. And uh, I would recommend you get one if you can get your hands on it. A little weird in that it grows the fruit right out of the end, just like a man of the branches, and then it sprouts new growth. But it seems vigorous. It treated well. The Barbados cherry I planted here, which is very common, perking up. Now, there's another Moringa tree 
from C. That's a pigeon pea. So there are lots of varieties of that you can eat the leaves. Certainly pigeon peas, certain moringa, certainly mulberry. In fact, mulberry leaves are to get the, the tips of the of, of the tree where it's fresh growth or it starts to get woody. It actually tastes almost like a lima bean kind of flavor to it. I quite like it. Now, here we are at the side, at one another side area. Oh, by the way, check out this screen door. Recommend this highly in backyards. Now that we've transitioned to it, I made it out of all recycled stuff, but lets the air through, increases the airflow, and also makes it much more interesting to have this I had leftover animal wire, and uh, the fence had broken, so it was an opportunity to rebuild it. And uh, we love it, we all love it. And now you're able to see into the backyard, which is much more interesting to look at than a fence door. This is a guava tree. I had no confidence this would survive. A neighbor of mine gave it to me. I planted it here with the hopes it might, but it's already showing on the new growth, it's already showing this kind of weird brown thing. And I think it's a very suscept it's a very uh, sensitive plant to salt, so it likely won't do well here. But I'll tell you what, the croton, the frangipani, no worries. I've got several varieties of aloe. I mean, I don't know. I, d I think I've just about done everything I can do with aloe around this area meaning grown all the types I know of that are common. But this is the medicinal aloe vera, which you always have to have some for the sunburns. And uh, this is another kind of more decorative spiraling type of aloe that's very common. And then this one has a much wider leaf to it, as you can see. So just, you know, in this little span, you see several different varieties of, of aloe. It's, it's just a great choice for most areas. Now, here's another. Ooh, got spiders growing webs everywhere. Spinning webs. Yeah, the longevity spinach. I was lucky enough to get some cuttings of that. I wanted to establish it in the pot. It's another great, hardy, big producer that was given to me. Um, yeah, by a friend. I've got to. Oh, here's the other thing. It used to be that I only got one harvest of star fruit a year. So the star fruit on the ground, we've got to chuck that into the back up into the, the beds. But the star fruit now comes in three, four harvests a year. It's a lot of it. You can't possibly keep up with eating it all. This is such a major producer of star fruit. Look at that one. That one is ready when they get orange like that. Recommend you get a tasty variety of star fruit in your life. Carambola. There are many varieties of star fruit. Not all are great. Some are more watery. So you want to be a little bit careful. I, how you, which one you select, do your research. If you look at the longevity spinach I've got growing here, it's really starting to jump up. That's what I like to see. This is what I like to see. So I plan on growing some big bushes of that around. It's another tasty leaf. I, w I wouldn't say it's a salad tree, but it's a tasty leaf tree. Now I'm hoping to make a video soon about salad trees going up to a local farm up in D-Land. I just need to try to make that happen this week. Might do that this week. And by the way, we have a hurricane out in the Atlantic Ocean. Doesn't seem like it right here in peaceful little coastal community USA, but there is a big old hurricane spinning out there that's going to shoot up the Atlantic Basin and give lots of waves to the whole coast, which is Fun because I surf. If you like surfing or want to check out my surfing channel, it's Surf All Day A1A, letter A, number one, letter A, Surf All Day A1A, all one word. Also, if you'd like to check out my original music channel, I would so, so, so appreciate a sub 
a subscription to Jedi Jingle Maker, all one word, the Jedi Jingle Maker channel. If everybody stream would just please subscribe to Jedi Jingle Maker, it would make my day. It really would. That's a brand new channel, and uh, I've loved to make music my whole life. I've got a good setup now where I can capture original music all the time, and I try to make the music videos entertaining, engaging, many philosophical underpinnings imbued in them to give them deep meaning or try to. So go check those out, Jedi Jingle Maker. Jedi Jingle Maker. I uh, have a little time off this week. I think I'm going to actually put a tidal wave of Jedi Jingle Maker tracks out. All right, let's go see what the Bunzos are doing. The Buntropolis is right back here. Now, if we lose connection, I will reconnect. We have some power lines up here that sometimes interfere with it, but just know I'll jump right back on. Okay. No, that's, that's a... Oh, there's the bunny. As you see... Penelope loves, we've repurposed this newspaper recycle bin because we have a different uh, type of bin now. And uh, it's the perfect rabbit house. Just turn it upside down. And newspaper, it's funny. Yeah, not many people reading newspapers now. Looks like an interesting idea. Obsolete, upside down. With a big fat rabbit, lion head bunny laying under there. She prefers that uh, sometimes. Sometimes she'll go back and lay on that rock. We've got logs laying around and all kinds of things for them to do, so depends, but they love to be down in the bunny run. We give these bunnies lots of exercise time, which uh, is really cool. Cool to watch them do their thing back here. This area I recently completely transformed. This was just a fence, and uh, it was blocking ventilation in this area pretty badly, so I opened it up, removed the top of the fence, just left the slats on the bottom, tried to give it a little bit of a architectural thing, <laughs> and uh, work with what was there. And what an improvement that is. That's a lot like the side door project of just adding a screen instead of a fence. So much more interesting to look at. Here I do use it for you know, ensuring the chickens don't get out and get into this area. If I were to let the chickens into the bunny run all the time, they would just scratch this mulch into, which was a recent change I did. I just added mulch all back through here, wood chips. Um, they would scratch it into the sand and it would be sandy again in no time. Because that's what chickies do. So we keep them separated. I was thinking I might put a little over here, a little doggy door to let them in and Occasionally, uh, if we put a thing up any kind of steps, they would probably fly over. They can actually fly on top of the coop, uh, in which they fly up here and get up into our, our backyard, but they don't do that a lot. But we definitely don't want them flying into the neighbor's yard. We might have a meet up with uh, Solo with Mr. Kitty or Raccoon. Well, let's see what's going on back here in the chicken run. These chickens have a tremendous shady area to go be in all day long. It's the chicken zoo. And the way we've set it up, let me collect the eggs back here. The way we've set it up is to be able to, you know, almost like a zoo. And I don't know if it's a, the chickens watching us or us watching the chickens, but it's back and forth. If you come out here, these chickens are coming up to greet you. You can call them in. They'll come when called, even if they're sleepy. They'll wake up and come over. Well, oh, look, she's looking at flying up. She's going to do it. On, you going to do it? Chicken Joe has got the itch. You can tell she's got the itch to fly onto the top of the coop. She might just do it. I thought for sure she was going to do it. And we've got one mulberry tree growing in here, a young one. You can see I've encaged it so that the chickens can't eat it because they'll eat those leaves right off and kill it. 
but I want it to grow, but it's not really. I think it's a little bit too shady in here for it to jump up that quickly. I also added a couple moringa trees back here. You like my uh, tree, my uh, branch that I used to you know, recycling uh, oak branches to use as poles. These moringa trees up to until they get big enough. But planted this one here. It's doing fairly well. And I planted that one. It's doing very well. Yeah, and all of this is to return back into, well, eating. I'm gonna, I want, what I wanna do is have enough moringa that I can eat one leaf a day, something like that, but just start adding some moringa to my diet. I think that would be a good, almost like a multivitamin. And which I do plan on doing. But I just have to get enough growing to, to be able to do that. Here's another thing I need to transplant, this mango. This likely Tommy Atkins mango tree. I need to transplant that from the compost bin where it grew into a pot. I've got some others that have grown from seeds. That I need to continue to care for to make sure they get to the next level. This is, is one, it's getting its second growth in this pot. That one, once it gets up to be about three or four feet tall, I'm going to graft a cutting onto it from this Tommy Atkins tree so that it will fruit. Because the thing is growing mangoes from seeds, there's two types of mango seeds, monocot, polycot, and depending on that, it will depend on whether you get you know, true to seed fruit, true to the tree fruit. So anyway, there's a lot of good videos on that. David the Good, I think, has a good one that you would want to check out if you're interested in that tough topic. I have some on the channel, too. But, uh, you know, growing fruit from seeds is something I've loved and enjoyed to do over the years, and it's pretty easy with the right plants. This is Suriname cherries, just growing like gangbusters. Oh, look at that. I don't know if you can see in here that these are all Suriname cherry trees. These are all viable trees. If I were to separate them, plant them in a pot, they'll grow very well and be pretty similar to the fruit they came from. But look at this. This is a papaya. It's actually a papaya. Interesting. We consider anything that grows in the ground and can be mowed grass. So this is cherry grass, papaya grass, grass grass. It's green. I want to give you another update. You know, what I've, my yard is on a, is a sand dune, basically. This is a barrier island, so this is just a big old sand dune. And any organics that are here is a result of, you know, them coming in. But this is what it generally looks like. You know, no, even none of that darker stuff if without, you know, what we've added. So we add topsoil to the top in order for grass and things like that to grow. It's very good for the for the yard and you can see how much greener it is here, more green, I suppose is the way to say it, than over here where we have not yet added it. It's kind of so-so. But that's a great hack for Florida, which is to know just add some topsoil, the stuff without the cow manure in it and all that, just the as straight compost as you can get uh, and add that. And, Man, it, it's I call it mini mulch because it adds a layer of water retention capability in your grass, and then you just kind of rake it into the grass so it falls down into the grass and just enriches the the area that it's in. I've I've done it to most of this area. Here's our footpath to the chicken run. We so added it all in there so that that can have a fighting chance of growing in. This area has been barren for a long time. Now, finally, it's starting to just want to perk up a little bit. Same thing here, but what we want to have is grass growing all the way through here. Healthy, strong growing grass. We had to get the sprinkler system figured out, though, in order to do it. Without that, it will not be grass. You have to water at certain times of the day just to be able to keep the water in the ground so it doesn't evaporate away which is basically the middle of the night. I irrigate my yard at uh, three o'clock in the morning, which is, you know, the time when I think the plants can benefit from it the most and get it into their systems 
prior to the sun coming up. So I think it's a, all the dew settling on plants that time of night anyway. I think it's natural cycle for plants, certainly. And uh, then you don't lose it to evaporation, which you don't want to waste the water. You want it to get into the plants. Yeah, peaceful, peaceful morning. I think what I'm going to do today, the waves have not shown up yet. Probably sometime tomorrow or later this evening, maybe they'll start showing up. That's always exciting when the long lines start to lumber in and you know the hurricane swell starting. There might be waves here for like two weeks if this turns out the way I'm thinking it's going to go, which is amazing. I'll be exhausted from surfing, but there'll be a lot of content coming out as a result because I do a lot of drone footage, etc., to capture all that stuff, and I've got some time off. But I think today I'm going to focus in on making some music for Jedi Jingle Maker. Got a track that I'm working on. Actually just got recently got a semi hollow body Ibanez art core guitar, which is amazing. It's like an imitation of the Lucille guitar for um, for uh, Gibson. All right, let's see. I'm going to go back on the comments just to make sure I didn't miss any. I'm walking around and I, I saw comments coming up. Okay, Tracy. How long has that big one been in the ground? And I think you're talking about the uh, fig tree or maybe the coconut tree, but the fig tree has been there for about a year and a half. And the coconut tree about close to a year. And Tracy says, I grafted key lime cuttings into a very established lemon tree, and they did really well. Wow, that's cool. Great way to cheat on some time for your fruit. I love that idea. Almost like a fruit cocktail tree. That's an amazing concept for sure. I have been intending to do that for a long time on this Tommy Atkins, which is such a vigorous mango tree. And to to graft on from the Edward, which is over here to the left, and then the Hayden behind me to get even more varieties of fruit. But what I wanted to do is have a fruit cocktail mango tree. So yeah, Tracy, that's a cool idea. I think, yeah, I would love to do that. Citrus is just so problematic in my yard because of the salt. Yeah, less chance of, this, of the uh, leaf burning when the salt doesn't land on the leaves during the sunny, hot day. I, I totally agree. Yep. You can definitely produce almost a lensing effect when you put water on, a, uh, on grass in the middle of the day in Florida because it's just so hot it magnifies the water and almost yeah, burns the leaf and gets the salt all over it. But yeah. Oh, you know what I, know I didn't do was, I, I'm going to finish this coffee. That looks good. All right. Is to eat the palm fruit. Eat the palm fruit. But you know what I didn't know? Was is the palm fruit too high to get to? I walked by it early. Uh-oh. Or did it all drop last night? I saw some yesterday up there. Oh, no. Well, there are a few, but they almost look rotten. Yeah, there they are. The, re the ripe areca fruit. Now, oddly, it looks like they're all, we missed the party. The palm fruit is turning back into seeds. Now, if you scoop up these seeds with your hands and just lay them on top of soil, they will grow quite easily. So this is a really easy one to grow. But I do not see, well, further, I don't, I won't be able to reach those without a, without a ladder. But yeah, this is such an easy tree to grow, the areca, and it, does produce palm fruit you can eat. A lot of people use it for like barriers, you know, to put along an edge. They're hardy growers. They're, they're from Madagascar, you know, where they're actually endangered. Here they grow like gangbusters, no issues. I always mention that they call it the sugarcane palm and you can see why. Looks like bamboo almost. It's one of those palms that just has a very distinct trunk. And something I've learned is that I just throw stuff in the rabbit cage and see what they like to chew on. They love to chew on this palm's fruit thing. So you see these like the fruit, uh, the 
palm nut flower stems, all those, the, the bunnies will absolutely devour. They love the flavor of those for some reason. This is a <laughs> pathetic grapefruit tree which was rescued in the citrus rescue area, but it's just clinging to life. I almost have to surrender on the citrus thing, but luckily I can fit it in here and there and just some of the shades of irrigation and, and sea wind. And the other thing is that that way is the Atlantic Ocean. So that thing is producing salt spray all the time. Now this time of the year, it's not too bad unless we've got a hurricane or tropical storm or something pressing it in real hard for days. But in the winter, in the fall and spring especially, we get flows of eastern wind where it's like 15 miles an hour for a week, two weeks, three weeks on shore. And as you drive down the coastal highway here, you can see in the street lights at night just the wave after wave of salt spray moving directly towards my house. Which I'm not complaining about, I'm just saying. It is the reason that I have this barrier along this eastern side of my yard, which is to allow this little Garden of Eden, because what is up above it will get fried by that salt blaster effect. And in fact, trees like this sometimes get pounded by it, but they, they can recover. Oh, let's look at this. I'll give you an update on the chocolate pudding tree. This thing is about ready to go, like bonkers with fruit. The biggest fruit harvest I've ever had off of it without any doubt, and it's 100% due to the bunnies. but look at how many fruit. They're just huge too. This one isn't necessarily the biggest one, but they're nice, big, healthy. Yeah, this is my apple tree, except for they are you know, basically persimmon. But once you, I've figured out now, once you get it to the right place in terms of giving it the nutrients it needs and 100% bunny manure, and I also add micronutrients. I get that dynamite granular nine month stuff. But once you get give it what it needs, it'll produce lots of fruit. Look at how many are up in there, if you can see that hopefully. Everywhere you look, and it set so many fruit and then dropped a ton of them. I was thinking, I wonder if it's I wonder if it's okay, but no, it's set plenty. So, no problem. These are actually quite good. They do have a, a flavor of chocolate pudding, the black sapote, but it's very mild, very mild. It's more like a vegetable than, uh, than a fruit to me, but I, I like it. And it's kind of a little weird because it's, it's black like chocolate pudding and it. it's uh, almost like an overripe avocado. Let's take one more look back here at Penelope the Bunzo. We didn't go in. Let's go in. Hopefully we won't re lose reception. Oh, there you are, Penelope. What you up to? You wanna come over here? Treat time for the chickens. We just got a treat dropped in. When they hear that door, they just know that the dinner bell has been rung. They're about to get something. Hey, Penelope. What you doing, bunny girl? Now that is a relaxed rabbit. Oh, here's another one, olive tree. Planted an olive tree. Now I have to, sh I have to have a barrier so that the rabbits don't eat it. 
before I uh, put this barrier up, I just planted it to see if the rabbits would eat it, and they hopped right up to it and started to eat it. So, look at Penelope, she's so sleepy. So sleepy, almost time to get Thumper down. Well, they take turns, their time in the rabbit run. Oh, and again, this hidden mango tree is just so gigantic. One of the things I'm considering doing, it's just become so huge, is, is topping it or even getting rid of it. Oh, I hate the idea of getting rid of it. I may just top it. I believe it will come back even if I topped it as severely as there, there, and there. I believe it would come back and bush up. But if you have any experience topping mango trees, let me know because this thing has just gotten to be a dominator of my yard and beyond the pickability of a picker, meaning I, could, I would have to risk life and limb to get up there to get those mangoes. They are so tall. I recently did an overhead perspective video. It's one of the last uh, videos I'd posted here about a week ago on the channel and showed how big this thing is, how much space it dominates with the canopy of shade in my yard, which is great actually, because look at how shady it is back here with that east breeze coming through. It's not bad at all. It's very, very nice for Florida. So we would lose that temporarily, but I believe it will bush right back up when it even severely trimmed back. And I've seen mango trees do that many times during freezes. Oh, look at you. Why are you being so loud there, Blondie? Didn't you get enough? Hmm. I wonder if they've got eggs in there. Let's take a look in the coop. Oh, there we are. Is there an egg in there? Coop cam. Yeah, simple system. I built it so that I have a door on the side. I should do a whole video just showing the, giving a tour of this coop, which is a four by four coop. But it's of course much larger with the underneath area. Let's get an eight by four underneath it, which this has been great because it, it allows us to have plenty of room for the chickens to roost at night but also they have a extended locked in area we can keep them in, in this caged area where if it rains, we can put them in, not have to put them inside the coop. They still can be out, but they get, they get uh, shaded from the rain, you know, sheltered from the rain by the roof. And they'll most of the time just instinctively go up underneath from the rain. A couple times the chickens have gotten soaked in the rain where they, you know, like if, if it's raining hard and they hear that you're, they think you're coming out, they'll just run straight out into the pouring rain to try to see what you're doing. So they do that, where so it's better to have them in the cage where they they can be held back from their urge to get drenched. Yeah, I don't know why. I just don't think it's a good policy to have wet chickens. I think you know we don't want them to be soaking wet. These barred rocks have a a type of feather that I think would do better, but the in the, the wetness. But the uh, golden sex links have like an under kind of feather area on their feathers that make them very soft. Actually, they're great like little pet birds. They're very soft and fluffy, but I think they get more wet, more easily, more easily wet than the uh, barred rocks. What'd you get there? What is that? What is that? What is that? Is that, a, that might be a roll. Oh, no, 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 that's not a roll. This is something that my wife made, which is a, we can do a video on this, top five chicken treats. And uh, my wife made this one, which is a, what you do is pour canned corn into a cupcake tin and freeze it. <laughs>
and they love it. They will peck at that thing until it starts to melt and then peck at every little delicious sweet piece of that corn. They love it. And what we typically do is put three or four of them all around the cage so that they can peck at them. But yeah, frozen chicken cupcakes. That's what they're doing, picking at it. Yeah, because once they get a taste of a little delicious piece that can't get enough, cools them down. Also, look at all these feathers. That's because these barred rocks are now start, are starting to molt. I believe they're losing their feathers to replace with new feathers, but we've been seeing feathers all over. And uh, I, I would possibly worry that it was because they were getting too, uh, too pecky with each other, but, you know, pulling out feathers, but I don't think that's what it is. And you see, like on Chicken Joe here, these little areas of feathers, I think it's just because their feathers are falling out, which is kind of cool. Part of bird life, molting. But yeah, they love that frozen thing. <laughs> but she is not, usually, usually Ponzi's a little bit more um, submissive, but with that treat, she's absolutely just saying, now you're not getting any until I'm done. And she's the biggest chicken. She'll hold it down with one claw. Look at her. Get away. She's going to defend that. She's got a claw in it, and she's not going to let anybody else have any. So interesting. Ah, oh, she got a delicious piece of corn. It's all worth it then. Well, all right. Thank you for joining the stream. We've been going on for here for about an hour. Looked all around. And, uh... I'll tell you what, we're off to a good start today. I hope you are too. Hope you have something cool planned. And uh, I, I would also encourage you to add some permaculture to your backyard, to your life. Maybe get some chickens. This gives you an idea of what it could be like. Thanks for watching Eat Your Backyard again. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up. Give me a comment. Let me know what you think. See you back on the next one.